Welcome to the day that Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics found themselves entangled in a heated exchange of trash talk with the Atlanta Hawks. Little did the Hawks know that this fiery exchange would become the catalyst for an unforgettable performance by Larry Bird, and this video brings you that performance. This story is not very well known, so the available footage from this Hawks game is limited, but we did include the footage that has been found in this video, but to maintain the flow and immerse you, our audience, in the moment, we've incorporated some clips from other Atlanta Hawks games for transparency, with NBA players that were involved on this day that talk about what happened and this insane story. To truly appreciate Larry Bird's iconic display, it's essential to dive into the backstory, which provides critical context. But I must note that if you want to skip forward, feel free, you just will be missing some important context. Full credit to all the footage and videos are on display on the screen right now, so don't forget to check them out, and they are also linked in the description box down below. If you enjoyed this video and desire more content just like this one, please support us by giving us a thumbs up. Let's aim for 3000 likes for the next video, and feel free to hit that subscribe button if you want more Larry Bird videos just like this one. I trust that you'll enjoy this video, and I don't want to keep you guys waiting. The Christmas game, a double overtime game in New York, played really poorly, had every chance to win that game. Come Christmas Day, there was more than presents that came unwrapped. The Celtics got their stocking stuffed with a game out of character, but it would later serve as an inspiration for preventing something similar ever to occur again. With Boston leading by 25 midway through the third quarter, New York mounted a comeback, led by the charge of Patrick Ewing. Driving in, Ewing didn't have control, but he makes the basket. And Ewing. The potential of what the Knicks can possibly do with a Patrick Ewing. He's got great speed, and when he gets up the court, he makes a heck of a target. Lead is seven again. Ewing backs it in. 18 for Patrick Ewing to keep the Knicks in the ball game. In an improbable script, and Patrick Ewing has been the engineer. A stunning upset. They were down by 25 points, and they came back. And this is going to be one of the big comebacks we have seen in many a year. And afterward, the team got together. Um, everybody got together and said, man, we, we got to play better than this. I mean, you know, we've been to the finals now three straight years. Or this, that would have been our, our third straight year of going to the finals. Been to the finals two straight years. This is, this is our best team we've had together. We always had good teams. 86 was definitely our best team. Yeah. I mean, with Bill Walton coming in. As your backup, Scotty Wedman. I mean, we, yeah. Jerry Sitchin. I mean, we, we were loaded. It's just a stacked team. It was the prime of the best players on that team. It was the prime of Bird, who was MVP that year. Mm -hmm. It was a prime of McHale. After games, used to always come in the locker room and pop a beer. And like, I, I winner, you know, we'd win a game, Bill would come in and open a beer. And I was like, that was the best game I've ever been involved in. And then the next night, that was the absolute best game I've ever been involved with. Uh, it, DJ and, and Chief were still in their prime, and that team was healthy. We were a different group of guys. We had won a lot, and we expected to win. Following the Christmas Day game against the Knicks, the Boston Celtics squad was disheartened by surrendering a 25-point lead and ultimately losing. The New York Knicks were the worst team in the entire association, and the Celtics were on a championship hunt. The loss to New York on Christmas Day was... Uh something that was embarrassing to the players, but yet uh, we have the uh, makeup of personalities on the team that uh, nothing really gets them down for long, and uh, they were able to bounce back and uh, carry on, and uh, you have to do that over an 82-game schedule. You can't uh, have those lows that are going to carry on for days, and uh, you want to just keep consistent play and, and carry on. The effects of the Christmas Day game were not visibly detected. To change their mood and approach would certainly mean a greater defeat for the Celtics than the one in Madison Square Garden. Everybody said, okay, look at man, we're dedicated. We, we, we lost a Christmas game, a double overtime game in New York, played really poorly, had every chance to win that game. And afterward, everybody got together and said, man, we, we got to play better in this. Our team's uh, challenges were to stay focused because we could win in any type of game. And we all got together and, you know, I remember Bill Walton. We were a very close team. And every night after the games, we were out together, usually at the Scotch and Sirloin. And one night we were sitting around very late and having a really good time. Of course, Bill says, 
We're really close to the championship here. How about we make a vow right now, right here and now amongst ourselves that nobody, nobody will take another drink until we win the championship. We're, we're not going to drink until, you, <laughs> until we win the championship. We are planning on winning it this year. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, I'll drink to that. And then Kevin, after about a 30 second pause of everybody saying, yeah, yeah, this is great. Kevin said, well, we're going to win the championship this year, aren't we? So <laughs> Bill said, well, of course, you know, so everybody quit drinking and we all got together. And from that point on, I think we were like 60 and 10. The Celtics had beat the wrap of Christmas Day and were riding a winning streak in January. But getting blown out in the first half in Atlanta, the streak seemed in jeopardy. Boston had visions of the infamous Christmas Day game dancing through their heads and decided to mount a comeback of their own, which was inspired by more than just Christmas memories. We're playing a game down in Atlanta, and this is how long ago this was, because Atlanta was a good team. And they had Dominique and Doc Rivers and Reggie Theus and Kevin the Penguin Willis and Tree Rollins and all these guys. And Atlanta had been waiting, I guess, about a month to just get us. Uh, they were, they'd been on a roll. And uh, little did we know coming in that they had this kind of emotion built up already. But uh, Atlanta, they talk trash. They're Down up by there. 20 at halftime. Yeah, that was in the crowds yelling and all that stuff. And we are getting hammered. We're just getting killed. We're down 25 at the half, and they're all trash talking. And fans are throwing stuff at us. And they're going, we're going to kill you, Celtic Bird, Walt, McHale, Parrish, DJ. You guys are all frauds. What are you talking about? with the exception of Dominique Wilkins, who had too much class to ever say a thing. They started the first quarter off and just ran us off the, off the court. Uh, at halftime, we're down 23. So we come in at halftime, we're just sulking in there, with tails between our legs. We walk in, we're sitting in the locker room, and Casey Jones, our fantastic coach, the most like John Wooden of any coach I've ever been a part of. Casey Jones got on us three times really hard, and that halftime talk he gave is one of the best I've ever heard. Casey walks in, he looks at us, looks at his watch, doesn't say a word, walks over to the cooler, pulls out a beer, pops the beer, goes and sits down, pounds down the beer, just sitting there. Finishes the beer, looks at his watch, looks at us, goes over to the cooler and gets a second beer. Pops the beer, pounding it down, doesn't say a word. Looks at his watch, looks around at us, goes and gets a third beer, does the same thing. And then he gets up, looks at his watch for the final time, and he says, uh, A lot of you guys have been here for a long time, but obviously you don't know what it means to be a, a Celtic, you know, in the whole thing. It was not enough that they uh, had, had a 23-point lead at the time, but they also had to uh, verbalize. At halftime, uh, they're about parasites. They're talking at us, they're slamming us, and then they're talking more. And he never screamed or never yelled, and he goes, you know, we got it in us to come back and win this game, but we have to do it. We got to dictate the second half of how we want to play. Yeah. Let's go. And then the team comes out in the second half, just eye of the tiger. And uh, we went back out the second half, and uh, everyone responded. So we go out there and we're warming up for the start of the, uh, the third quarter. And they got a record sellout crowd there at the Omni. And they're gonna start the third quarter. And you watch an NBA game and nobody wants to ever take the ball out of bounds because they know they're never gonna get it back. Larry Bird always took the ball out of bounds. The selfless sacrifice that was Larry Bird's defining personal characteristic, what he would do to make other people's dreams come true. He's going to take the ball out of bounds, and that referee comes, and the referee hands the ball to Larry to start the third. We're down 25. Larry takes the ball and pushes it back into the midsection of the referee so that he can't get away, and the referee is like startled, staggered. What's going on here? We're all right there, right in front of the Celtic bench. And Larry looks right into the soul, right through the eyes of that referee, and he says to him, we're not going to quit. You make sure you don't quit either. The guy just like melted on the spot. And we got out there and we ended up beating him. And then the second half started and it was just phenomenal because 
he just kept going. Larry hit 11 straight shots to start the third, including seven threes. We were tied at the end of the third. We won in overtime. We did not need a plane to get home. Bird winds up from three. Yes, Larry Bird missed it. Yeah, a lot of wasted motion there. Yeah, made a tough shot out of what should have been an easy. Bird, three in a row. Hot Rivers, Ains back the other way. And now Bird for the Celtics. Fakes the pass. Bang! Larry Bird! So, uh... Let's see what happens. I think we have. Uh, tries to go along the baseline, kicks it back to Bird. Bird fires. Bird hits. A triple team Bird. He gets it in the front court to Johnson. Back to Del Larry Bird. Whoa! Sometimes it gets in the fourth quarter the, and three or four minutes ago and everybody will come and say, okay, Larry, it's time to take over. You know, that's the greatest feeling in the world. Here you're playing with uh, some of the best players in, in the game and here they come to you and say, okay, it's time to take over, take over the game. And uh, that's a heck of a feeling. Knowing what to do before everybody else knows what to do. And uh, that's the type of speed he has and uh, that's what makes him the fastest player in the league. There's something within me that just says, hey, you... If you're going to be the best, you got to work at it, and I'm not afraid to work, uh, especially it's something I love to do. In the second half, the Celtics shot 64% from the floor, and led by Bird's 41 points, Boston nailed down the comeback 125-122 in overtime, sending a message to everyone. That was my favorite regular season win from the 86 team, which was my favorite team. Larry Bird, you're awesome. You know, first I want to clear some of uh, Casey Jones never drink a beer at half. That's the biggest bunch of BS I ever heard. Come on. Unless Bill was drinking one with it. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, here are two other Larry Bird videos I think that you will also enjoy, so be sure to check them out. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.